at the Kaiser Shipyards in Richmond, California, the SS Benjamin Warner, last Liberty ship to be built on the Pacific coast, stands ready for launching. A miniature Statue of Liberty presented to the record-breaking shipbuilders of Richmond is unveiled in the presence of Henry Kaiser, one of America's foremost production experts. The new vessel, last of the Liberty ship class, slides down the ways. Kaiser shipyards will now manufacture the new, larger, and faster Victory ships for the Allies. The SS Benjamin Warner takes its place in the great fleet of American-built merchant vessels. At Chongqing in China, Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek meets a plane arriving from Russia. Aboard is Henry Wallace, Vice President of the United States, here as the personal representative of President Roosevelt. At a servicemen's club, Wallace is welcomed by Red Cross workers. On this important tour of the Far East, he takes time off for a volleyball game with American soldiers. With Madame Chiang Kai-shek, Vice President Wallace visits an orphanage of a China now in the eighth year of its war with Japan. Chinese youngsters greet the visitor from far off America. At Chiang Kai-shek's summer residence, over 150 guests attend an official banquet given by the Generalissimo and Madame Chiang in Wallace's honor. Chiang proposes a toast to the victory of the United Nations. At Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, delegates from 44 allied and associate countries arrive for the opening of the United Nations Monetary and Financial Conference. Invited by President Roosevelt to the first major world financial meeting since the London Conference of 1933, they will work in the seclusion of this White Mountains resort. Zhang <music> Shi Kung, one of China's representatives, with Secretary and Mrs. Henry Morgenthau. United States Treasury Secretary Morgenthau heads the American delegation. On the opening day, in his role of acting conference president, he addresses the meeting. To be discussed are plans for the stabilization of world currencies. All agreements must be ratified by the governing bodies of the nations involved before becoming effective. Delegates to this monetary and financial conference pose on the hotel lawn. These meetings are designed to promote trade in the post-war world and to create a foundation for lasting peace. Washington's National Airport, a giant army transport plane comes in from Algiers, bearing a famous visitor on his first American trip. Arriving for conferences of extreme importance with President Roosevelt is Charles de Gaulle, leader of the fighting French. A 17-gun salute is given for the distinguished visitor, who is welcomed with high military honors. The French National Committee, led by de Gaulle, has been accepted as the authority for civil administration of liberated France. General Marshall, Admiral King, and General Arnold join in saluting France's national anthem, the Marseillaise. 
The goal renews an old acquaintanceship with General George Marshall, United States Army Chief of Staff. Admiral Ernest King, Commander-in-Chief of the American Fleet, General H.H. H. Arnold, Commander of the Army Air Forces, and President Roosevelt's two military aides, General Watson and Admiral Brown, also greet the nation's foremost visitor. General de Gaulle leaves for the White House and a meeting with President Roosevelt, which is greatly to increase agreement and understanding between America and the new France. The fighting French leader is cordially welcomed by the President, his daughter Anne Bottiger, and Secretary of State Cordell Hull. Navy Secretary James Forrestal and Harold Ickes, Secretary of the Interior, join in this official greeting. Next day in Arlington Cemetery, General de Gaulle pays homage at the grave of the unknown soldier, an American who fought and died on the soil of France in the last war. Today in Normandy, Americans and Frenchmen again fight side by side. From Washington, de Gaulle arrives at New York City Hall. The people of Manhattan give him a tremendous ovation. From atop the RCA building, France's leader sees America's largest city, including his visit, which has reaffirmed the ancient bonds of friendship between America and France, General Charles de Gaulle speaks to the people of the United States. I am glad to be on American soil and again to have met President Roosevelt. We have talked. And I found thus we have a common understanding of the grave problems facing us. I take this opportunity to thank the American people for the wonderful effort they have made to win this war today as in 1918, your American boys are fighting side by side with the French soldiers. Together, we are marching on the road to Berlin, to Tokyo, to a final victory. <laughs> 